Okay, it's seven o'clock. So welcome back everyone. Um, I'm Nora Paulovich with the North Peace Applied Research Association based out of the peace country in Northern Alberta. If you did not join us last night, this is uh, part two of our webinar with Steve on minerals. And I'm going to let Steve take over the screen now. And we received a couple questions, uh, which I believe Steve was able to answer already, but uh, that's the first thing that he would like to do is uh, answer any questions that may have come up um, since we met last night. Not seeing any, Steve. I know you came up with a few um, sources um, that you had on the screen when we first started, if you wanted to talk about them. Yeah, so we'll get to that slide. I thought that I would uh, kind of go through these um, quickly. Uh, you know, are, do we have enough minerals in our grasses or like most of us, are we too low? And so we're in an acid system and that's what's leading to the diseases, the internal external parasites, how close do you live to the neighbor's toxins? Um, anyway, uh, the abundant nutrition is what's going to get us the phenotypic expression of the genetics that we already own. A lot of different issues that people have, maybe yours aren't on this list, but uh, Getting your animals with a clean, mineral-rich inner uterine environment helps the earlier in life, as evidenced by how far this ball is up the uh, landscape here. The earlier in life you do the right thing, the, uh, the more of a chance we have to move the animals over to the right-hand side of the landscape. Uh, Gabe Brown, everyone on the calls probably heard of Gabe, and if you haven't, you really ought to Google him and read a little bit. He's got a book uh, on that. Uh, Maynard Murray, he was seeing uh, uh, when he brought these sea minerals, and uh, I just have the, the Redmond real salt here, but the uh, number 10 livestock salt. Uh, we looked for a source of sea salt uh, in Canada. We didn't find one yet. Um, as uh, man started plowing uh, with uh, tractors instead of uh, behind it, team of horses, uh, the minerals went down and we created this for ourselves and for our livestock. Um, question? Nora, if somebody had a question, I can stop anywhere through here. Yeah, no questions so far, Steve. Okay, so as we, uh, as we, as someone, uh, <laughs> Patented glyphosate, you know, when it came on the market in 31 years, we had this tremendous increase in all of these diseases. Um, all of the ones on the right hand side are the ones that uh, glyphosate chelates or grabs a hold of, can't get them out of those plants, even if they're in there. Um, Weston A. Price, uh, he went around the world. The common denominator in the 30s was those 15 groups of people around the world in, in perfect health were getting five to 10 times the vitamins and minerals the average American was getting. And we do not get half of that today. Again, acid creates disease, humans, livestock, alkaline prevents disease. We can change that. Um, so into the sea salts here, uh, see mineral salt. We need four or five ounces. You're going to have to entice them to get that in there dry. Uh, just the different forms uh, of sea salt that are out there. Uh, if you're buying it for the house, it needs to have some color to it. Uh, this one here doesn't really have the, the badia sea salt, doesn't have it. And then uh, back in the day, they used to add aluminum to make it pour when it rained, well, that was tying up the iodine they put in there. So 20% bioavailability, dry sea salt in the mineral box, all right? We're making this second uh, stock tank uh, that's 45 to 50% bioavailable. 
perfect balance, only three and a half percent sodium chloride if we make it right. But if we get those minerals in the soil through a plant, they are 90% bioavailable and grass can take up 90 of the 92 minerals. So we're feeding this five ounces dry. The cow doesn't need it all. 80% of it goes out the back, but it's making more mineral rich grass for next year in your pasture. So it's not wasted. Um, so here we are about to make this uh, second stock tank. So every other day, day one, we're putting our tea bag in there in the morning, pulling it out at night. Day two, we don't do anything. They're getting back to fresh water. Day three, fresh sea mineral salt, leave it in there, daylight hours, pull it out at night. And you could just continue that whenever you have access to a stock tank. Oops. And it'll help keep the stock tank somewhat thawed out in the winter time if you're doing this in a not metal tank. You will rust out a metal tank. Uh, curing pink eye in the middle of pink eye season, we're gonna have to have two tanks. Uh, we, we need to start out without a float and make sure the cattle know what it is and then you can graduate to the float system, um, which I think everybody saw this last night. Uh, with the float about it takes about 25 pounds of sea salt in your tea bag the woven nylon feed sack um, for a hundred animals for about two days and that's in about summertime winter time your artesian water some kind of city water it's all going to vary it's the amount of salt, unused salt, you're throwing away every time you empty that tea bag will let you know whether you're wasting salt or you didn't put enough in and you and you weren't throwing about 10% away. Um, on this slide, all I was doing was uh, if anyone here has this, uh, these kind of stock tanks, what I was trying to show was uh, this inch and a half black poly if you make a couple of laps up underneath that top rim, you can make those tanks last about three times as long because you're beefing them up up there. Anyway, um, I always suggest people leave whatever mineral they're already feeding out there. And I've never seen one where the cattle didn't back off by at least 50%, but Typically, it's three quarters or more. Most people just wind up stopping putting out their old mineral program. Um, so we're putting 93% sea salt in that tea bag. If we take it out uh, in the no float system in three or four hours, we're only at three and a half percent sodium chloride. If we're leaving it in with the float system, it reaches homeostasis. Cows come and drink, more water goes in, a few more minerals come out. Cows come and drink, a few more minerals come out. That's, that's why you can uh, put more in and leave it in there longer. Quick um, question, Steve. We saw a... Oops. Can I interrupt for a question? Question. If sure, you absolutely. Use, uh -huh. Okay. If you use a rubber tire water sitting on concrete, will the salt water degrade the concrete eventually? Eventually, but it'll take quite a while. Okay. Yeah, that, there's a, been a lot of people do it in rubber tire mm -hmm. tanks with concrete. Yeah. But, uh, you know, think about the sidewalks in the winter, you know, using all the salt mm -hmm. on and how long it does take. And we didn't need a hole through, we just took the shiny surface off the top. So right. th okay. they are correct. Um, yep. Okay, any Second other questions? question, yep. Mm -hmm. Is there any benefit of adding biochar to mineral? Uh, the biochar, when we get into this uh, detox clay here in a little bit, it works very similarly to the to the detox clay so yeah we can uh, we can talk about that 
Uh, is there a, uh, maybe the question ought to be, is there a, a good source up there? And it may be the go-to thing uh, because you can get it for, well, it's a Canadian product and it doesn't cost as much to haul it to wherever you right. live. Right. Mm -hmm. Next question, how is the best way to apply sea salt directly to pasture? Uh, you can foliar your feed. Uh, I've used the boominator nozzles rather than the individual nozzles. Um, and um, I guess the best, the well, <laughs> in two days time, you will raise the bricks, foliar feeding through the plant. A fellow called me, uh, golly, about five years ago at the end of June, he was in New Mexico. It's getting warm. And he would been um, uh, he'd been weighing his cattle every two weeks, and the first of May they were gaining two pounds, and then a pound and a half, pound and a quarter. They're down to a pound a day. Uh, it's getting hot. He was wondering what he could do. We talked for 20, 30 minutes, and and finally decided three pounds of Redmond salt per acre. He was on a 62 acre pivot. I think it was Bermuda and orchard grass. So he weighed the cattle, he bricks the grass, then he sped the pivot up and he put this, well, that would be 186 pounds. I'm sure he dumped four bags in there, 200 pounds. Sped the pivot up so it was a quarter of an inch of water. So it was a fertigation. And um, in two days time, the bricks of the grass had doubled and it was a ridiculously high gain at the end of two weeks because of the compensatory gain, those animals were growing in height, but not in weight. But at the end of eight weeks for $30 worth of sea salt on 62 acres in the middle of the summer when grass should be lignifying, remember in, in first of May, they were gaining two pounds a day. They gained three pounds a day for that 60 days. So a person could, foliar or fertigate every 60 days start right off first thing in the spring 60 days later and then maybe a month before the end of the growing season you could do a third one um redmond has a product called uh sr50 and sr65 um the sr50 is half and half sea mineral salt half this detoxifying clay uh, if you put uh, 150, 200 pounds of that per acre, um, another another story about that. Uh, met some a couple of brothers, and they were doing uh, 2,200 acres of alfalfa. So they took a a half of a pivot, and on one side they put a commercial fertilizer that cost $105 an acre and it was supposed to last for three years. On the other side, they put 200 pounds of Redmond SR50. And uh, at the first cutting, they were a thousand pounds ahead on the Redmond side. Well, there wasn't time for the minerals to get in there. There was no nitrogen applied. They, um, there was on the commercial fertilizer side, it was the, the conditioner, the detox clay had bound the toxins. So the, the alfalfa didn't have that backpack of toxins and it grew faster. At the end of the first year, they were a ton ahead on the Redmond side. Second year, they didn't do anything on the uh, commercial fertilizer side because that was a three year uh, application. So they put another 200 pounds of the Redmond SR50 and chicken compost for a nitrogen source. And at the end of that year, they'd gain 1.8 more tons. The third year, they didn't do anything to either side and they still gained another one ton on the Redmond side. So over the course of three years, for about 60% of the cost of commercial fertilizer, they had uh, gained 3.8 tons more alfalfa on that pivot. Uh, what I didn't say here is at the beginning of the second year, they quit all commercial fertilizer and went to the 
chicken compost and SR50. And uh, they said they saved 75 or or $100,000 worth of fertilizer on their uh, 2,200 acres. Hopefully I covered both sides of that. Uh, okay. Good. Did, we're good. One other okay. question. Is sure. there any benefit of adding sulfur to mineral for pink eye or ringworm? Um, Nora, I'm going to send you some notes that okay. we compiled over the course of about four schools that I did with Steve Swarzik. Yep. Uh, sulfur used to be okay about 20 years ago, but there's this nanotoxin that we now have, thank you very much, Roundup, that sulfur tends to turn on along with uh, potassium, nitrogen, and sulfur, potassium, nitrogen, and can't think of the fourth one right now. Um, anyway, you can get in trouble if you've got any other sources. Uh, a lot of sulfur and DDGs. Um, so if you're only doing one source of sulfur, you probably get along all right and not, not have a problem, but it's a Band-Aid. Sulfur is not gonna turn the animals alkaline. It would be a Band-Aid. It would be like using the baking soda, which would be a much better Band-Aid uh, to get the animals alkaline. Um, but the, the, real, the real problem is low bricks, low fertility in the soil. Okay. So I would rather see somebody for uh, flies use uh, garlic. Now, there is some sulfur in garlic but way less than uh, dusting sulfur or something like that. Okay, that was the last question. Okay, um, we saw those equals uh, health and acid equals disease. And uh, the, the lower the mineral content of our soil, the more the neighbor's toxins are there. I mean, organic by default. I buy a piece of ground, I'm gonna stop spraying, I'm gonna grow vegetables. Organic by design, I'm gonna buy that same piece of ground. The neighbor's toxins are in there, I gotta get those out. Somebody took all the minerals, I gotta get those back. And then I'm gonna grow the vegetables. A much different outcome, even though both are considered organic. So whether it's across the road or half a world away, uh, we get the neighbor's toxins if the wind blows where you live. Um, just a way to uh, entice the, the sea salt uh, by using apple cider vinegar. We're gonna talk more about that. Uh, there's a place in uh, Nebraska that, that custom feeds that mixes that 531 and the enticers right in there. Um, did I tell the story last night of the fellow in South Dakota with the, with the pink eye problem and in 36 hours the flies left because we used the bicarb and the conditioner? I believe you did, Steve. Okay, okay, that's good. Um, more valuable manure. We're gonna have better grass next year than this year and the cows are spreading it out for us. So we, we looked up uh, there in Canada where you could get some of these some of these things. Um, Blake has the Redmond products and then uh, sodium bicarbonate. We couldn't really track this all down. I was pretty busy today, but they're your neighbors up there. Uh, if you want me to talk to them or you talk to them and then you want to talk to me, uh, my number will be at the end of this. Uh, happy to share that with you. So the other place to, uh, we found a clay product very similar to the Redmond uh, conditioner is in uh, southeastern Saskatchewan. So it's a, it's a Canadian product and it, uh, it's much closer so the freight would be less. Um, do I need to leave that up any longer or you can share this slide, I guess, with people, Nora? I think that's good. Okay, okay. So uh any other questions about the sea salt before we switch gears into the the detox here 
So on the soil, I talked about the people there with the alfalfa, how they used it in stock ponds. Uh, I was just talking to a fellow yesterday. I had done a school in South Dakota. Oh, golly, a month ago. And uh, I'd mentioned this in stock ponds. Well, now he's got four people in Montana with stock ponds that they want to they wanna do a, a research project and see how much of this Redmond conditioner, this clay, to pu put in these stock ponds and uh, how much it would clean up the water. Um, one time I was down in Southern Utah and I was talking about putting it in the stock ponds out there on the Arizona Strip and whatnot. And, and I called the people there at Redmond, oh golly, a couple months later. And, and I said, was there any kind of an uptick in the amount of conditioner that got sold down there after I talked at those two schools? I never heard anything back from them, but about a week later, this nice big box with toothpaste and sea salt and everything showed up on my door. So I guess they must have sold a little conditioner after that talk. But if you've got an acre pond, I would suggest taking 100 pounds of that clay from uh, Saskatchewan or the Redmond a couple times a year and just go around there and kind of throw it as far out into the water as you can all the way around the, the pond to bind the toxins and then you'll get colloidal minerals coming up in the water and it's kind of fun in a lot of those places within about five minutes the amount of activity on the surface of that water is pretty incredible what's coming up in the water and then what's coming from above down to it. Um, if you're going with the two stock tanks in the middle of the summer, uh, depending on the size, a quart or two of the, the clay in your freshwater tank, the water won't actually get quite so warm in the summer, but you'll be getting colloidal minerals. I, I get to a lot of places where they're on city water. And uh, if you are on city water and you make the, um, the second stock tank with the mineral water, your cattle will probably drink a little more mineral water than somebody who's not on city water because you put enough sea salt, sea mineral salt in that tea bag in your stock tank. Well, the chlorine and the fluorine that are in the city water will now be on the bottom of the tank. They will settle out. And then, of course, you can put it in the mineral box uh, so the cattle ingest it. So we've introduced all of these different uh, unique substances over the last 75 to 100 years. Drugs don't have side effects. They just have effects. Usually you get far enough down there and one of them's death. Uh, doesn't make me wanna use dr uh, drugs very much. And if somebody's advertising something, that means I probably don't want to be buying it. Um, oh, the Redmond conditioner. So I kind of look at it as um, it takes 500 straws to break the camel's back. If, if we're feeding enough of this Redmond conditioner and then three or four ounces a day is kind of enough to kind of get them over the hump, the minimum amount, it'll get rid of the first 400 or 450. So their immune system is not spinning in the mud. So when something comes along, and it's the same way for us, something comes along that's a challenge to our immune system, we're ready to go. We're not, we don't have it all busy with all this little stuff. Um, I, uh, I like putting it in my socks, the Redmond clay or the screened conditioner, so when I'm out working, I can detox 12 hours a day, 300 days a year. Um, and they're uh, talking about using an antibiotic here to uh, help with people that get COVID. Well, basically they're killing off the bad stuff in most people's diet, diet because they have the standard American diet. Uh, bad bad stuff in people's gut because they have the standard American diet. Well, it's doing kind of the same thing, but actually the clay, the clay, it binds toxins and it actually promotes the growth of the healthy 
uh, biology in our gut. So uh, it offsets that bad diet that a lot of us have. Um, so March 11th, 2011, just a little over 10 years ago, there was a tsunami in Japan. And the first lap of that cesium cloud um, across the US was from Boise to Philadelphia. And I live right about there. Anyway, uh, human miscarriages doubled in the next 12 months. And uh, there were some really interesting things uh, in cattle uh, that year. And then two, three, and four years later, uh, there wasn't enough cesium to cause an abortion in that cow. So then that offspring, some of the things that happened and all I could sort it back to, well, this is a half of a world away. Um, I mean, back in the 30s, you saw the dust cloud coming, you could see the danger, but today, uh, I hope the fellow on the right owns the field on the left or he is not being a good neighbor to his neighbor. Um, and uh, on this one, this is the day of the year here. And watch when we get into late March, how much CO2 we get in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. Hi, this is Bill Putman. I'm a climate scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. What you're looking at is a supercomputer model of carbon dioxide levels in the Earth's atmosphere. The visualization compresses one year of data into a few minutes. Carbon dioxide is the most important greenhouse gas Here's affected LA. by human activity. About half of the carbon dioxide emitted from fossil fuel combustion remains in the atmosphere, while the other half is absorbed by natural land and ocean reservoirs. In the Northern Hemisphere, we see the highest concentrations are focused around major emission sources over we North America, Europe, and Asia. Started farming. Notice how the gas doesn't stay in one place. The dispersion of carbon dioxide is controlled by the large-scale weather patterns within the global circulation. During spring and summer in the Northern Hemisphere, plants absorb a substantial amount of carbon dioxide through photosynthesis thus removing some of the gas from the atmosphere. We see this change in the model as the red and purple colors start to fade. And uh, if you're doing the Gabe Brown thing and you've got a living root all the time, when the neighbors start stirring dirt, you're gonna, his carbon is free. It's going right in your ground. The other thing they're not saying in there is those toxins that had gotten sprayed on the neighbor's ground are getting a second chance at blowing on to you. Um, so this toxin that broke the camel's back, I, uh, I kind of talked about that. The Redmond conditioner gets rid of the first four or 450, but a fellow called me up about a little over five years ago, and he had some registered low-lying heifers that had some hoof and ankle problems. The action was wrong, and there was all this noise, and nothing was making sense. Finally, I said, well, are you feeding any GMOs? And he says, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, corn stalks last fall, Roundup Ready alfalfa. And I said, so you're trying to make a sow's ear out of a silk purse? I couldn't shame him into getting... A different hay. So I said, you need to feed six ounces of the Redmond clay, which that that much there below, whoops, below my fingers, that would probably be about six ounces per heifer per day until a month after the, uh, the hay is gone, which was going to be about three and a half months down the road. He called me up in three weeks and said, the symptoms are all gone. Uh, a friend came, well, I didn't know him at the time. A friend came to a school a little over four years ago and um, first evening he called his nephew and told him about the conditioner. Uh, the nephew's cattle were getting eaten up with lice. And so he was feeding the six ounces a day, having to entice them to get him to consume that much. 
And he went out on the fifth morning and the, the cattle had stopped scratching. They, he turned them alkaline quick enough, the lice left in the middle of winter. Uh, this fellow there that uh, did the, uh, the mineral water with the tea bag, first time he put conditioner out down there, if you remember right, I said when I got there, he had a mineral problem, a toxin problem, and an energy problem. First time he went to put the conditioner out for 118 head, he had five bags of conditioner, 250 pounds. He had five bags of cane sugar, 125 pounds. He went back 14 hours later and it was all gone. Those cattle had consumed over two pounds of conditioner in 14 hours. I said, skip a day. They, they might have just been going after the energy and the sugar. So the next time it was five bags of conditioner and two bags of the uh, sugar. And it didn't quite take two days. So they were still at a pound a day. He was down to about 5% enticer average after that. Uh, what you're looking at here is uh, these happy lines are kind of a welt looking thing here right underneath the cursor. And I've been going to this place in New York and they were putting the conditioner out, but they would never put any enticer in it. And uh, I was there in March. I think this is about June. I was there in March and I said, well, you've got 70 cows in this pasture, put 280 ounces of conditioner uh, on top of the baleage, it was it was damp hay that they were feeding. And, you know, accordingly to, to all these different groups that they had, I came back about three months later. And for the first time in four years, I saw happy lines and I saw happy lines on half of their cattle. Um, I think I told the story last night, the fellow coming to uh, the school and he had 30 active cases of pink eye. He made the mineral water. Um, Tom Swerzyk, a, uh, a veterinarian that did pathology and at the University of Kentucky, uh, the same one that did the autopsy and secretariat, he got called up to Canada a few years ago to a 3,000 head dairy, and their complaint was 35% first service AI. So they tested some stuff and said, well, there's three things in here you really shouldn't be feeding and we'd like you to feed 10, 12 ounces of conditioner, 10, 12 ounces of sea salt per dairy cow per day. So they split the herd in two. 60 days later, the, uh, the control group was just where it was before, but the, the ones getting all the conditioner and the sea salt were uh, at 70% first service AI and two more liters of milk uh, per day per cow. So they then stopped the experiment and everybody went on a lot of conditioner and a lot of sea mineral salt. Uh, the clay, it absorbs paper towel and it adsorbs. You, you think about a, a bead of water maybe on the outside of a, a glass or a plastic jar. And uh, there's a positive negative uh, thing going on. So it's very effective at grabbing a hold of toxins and pulling them out. I know it gets Roundup. I don't know if it gets atrazine. Uh, it's really hard to develop masculine males if there's atrazine around. We started using it in 59 in corn, but they're cousins. Uh, it helps. Um, on the human side, the very best uh, product out there to get rid of glyphosate in your, in your food, or I guess I should say out of your body after you've eaten the food that's had it, is a product called Biome by Zach Bush. And uh, it's even more effective than the, than the detoxifying clay. Uh, any questions on all of this, Nora, or just keep going? Keep going. Okay, so uh, typically if you start out with 100 pounds of, uh, of the clay and then about 25 pounds of enticer, and I've got the list there. Um, if you've got a, uh, a TMR, 
uh, and the feed is any kind of moist, you don't need an enticer. You just put it in the feed. You can put, depending, you know, someone I was talking to today asked a question about the winter versus summer. The, uh, the more lignified, the more dried out, the lower the mineral content of your feed, the more sea salt you need every day, the more conditioner you need every day. We're trying to get them, the more uh, baking soda you would need every day. We're trying to get or keep them alkaline. So we know in the summer above 86 degrees, all the grasses lignify except clover. We know we're gonna start going acid in the middle of the summer. In the middle of the winter, we're, we're either grazing standing forage or we're feeding hay. Uh, that is not as nutritious as a green growing plant. So that's when we're going to need the most sea mineral salt, the most conditioner, the most baking soda. Um, so stop feeding that conditioner or that stuff from Wilcox, uh, Saskatchewan. If anything negative shows up, stop right down here at the bottom, stop feeding 30 days before calving because it's an optimizer. If things are going good, they'll go better if you're feeding this clay. We can grow an even bigger calf. We might be pulling more calves. So 30 days before you start calving, you should stop feeding the conditioner. Now, I don't wanna stop any earlier than that because Three weeks before any mammal gives birth, there's a mineral transfer from mom to junior, and we really want a clean, mineral-rich transfer. In humans, if mom's got enough for the baby but not herself, it's what they call postpartum depression um, because she didn't have enough minerals for both of them, but the baby needed it more than she did to continue life. Um, anyway. 30 days before you put the bulls in, you probably ought to try to get back up, not to just a three, but four or five ounces of conditioner for that 30 days before breeding. So if you get pink eye, foot rot, scours, whatever, stop feeding the conditioner, the, uh, the clay there out of Wilcox. Stop feeding the, the clay 30 days before calving. You, you want to, well, I got to back up. If, if you, anything negative shows up, try to double the amount of sea salt going in. Stop feeding the conditioner. But if you're feeding an adequate amount of things to keep the animal alkaline, you shouldn't have pink eye, foot rot, scours show up. Anyway, and then the best use, if you are only going to feed conditioner for one month out of the year, it would be that one month before breeding. And uh, here, uh, a fellow, is he's got, uh, oh, I don't know, his fingers in there, uh, what, about this far. He, he has put uh, conditioner and sea salt mixed together on top of a protein tub. He was using the protein tub as his enticer. Um, they wanted the protein tub. They were going to have to eat their broccoli before they could get their ice cream. Uh, if you don't have them mixed together, two days of sea salt and then a day of conditioner. Two days of sea salt, a day of conditioner. If you're going to be feeding the protein tub anyway, use it as your enticer. And then how toxic is the environment? Uh, how much does the wind blow there? Um, smoke. Smoke sucks selenium out of the body faster than anything else. If you burn a wood stove, if you ever used to uh, smoke, you, you need Brazil nuts and you need to get them in the shell so that they're still at full strength. Leave them in the freezer. You can crack them open with a pair of pliers. Uh, if you're a smoker, you probably ought to have four or five a day. If you quit smoking, uh, just a couple, if you're burning wood stove in the winter, three or four, um, the first thing selenium is going to do in the body is detoxify lead, mercury, and cadmium. Well, if we've got a mineral that's mixed and it has individual ingredients from China and we've got all this cadmium going in, we're burning through all that extra selenium, just trying to get rid of the cadmium we added to the mix. 
Um, so this is a fellow there in Manitoba two years ago. No, it was just this last uh, November. And he was just so tickled with how black his black cows were because they were brown two years earlier when uh, I'd first showed up at his place. And he's been doing basically the things that uh, we're talking about. So while we got the cows right here, see this cow, she's almost flat from bone backbone hook bone. Well, you know, a flat back cow, this is up just a little bit, down a little more. Oops, I hit the wrong button there. Um, don't really see one that's really flat, but I like a flat hook bone, backbone, hook bone, all the same level uh, and no raised tail process. He's pretty good. This cow here is kind of level, uh, rounded down in the rump. Anyway, um, so a guy in, uh, in uh, Springview, Nebraska said this, he was feeding eight, well, seven to eight ounces of, um, uh, Kansas salt because he was you know close to that source and it was taking 1.3 ounces of soybean meal to get that in him he he looked like an umpire at home plate uh, when I got I talked to him in the fall there probably first part of October and I was back in in August and he told me how much he was feeding and I said well you could probably get down to five ounces and he just He's like, I want to change a thing. He said, a year ago, I didn't want to go look at my cows. I knew I was going to have to doctor something. It is so nice just to go out there and enjoy my cows. I don't have to worry about, about anything being sick hardly ever. Um, so uh, I just got a picture here, two conditioner, one bag of sugar. Uh, to start, that usually gets them started, and then you're going to wind up being somewhere between five and fifteen percent um, on an ongoing basis, just depending. Uh, if you could get, if you could average three ounces a day year round, you would be in real good shape there. Um, and then add it to your fresh water tank, and that water won't get quite as hot in the summertime uh, if the conditioner's in there. And then just you know, a homemade uh, mineral feeder here, three compartments. This thing isn't quite beefy enough, but you know, boy, we got some rim space on that deal. Here they've got some rim space and then they were putting vinegar, I think in this uh, used uh, uh, lick tank. Uh, if you're using these and you've been getting by with one, you're gonna need more rim space if you're going to try to get five ounces of sea salt three ounces of conditioner one ounce of baking soda and i would mix the conditioner or the wilcox clay and the baking soda together the the stuff out of rifle colorado or uh there in uh wyoming it's out of green river wyoming i can't think of the name of it right now Anyway, that stuff the cattle actually like, it's, it'll be a little bit of your enticer to consume more of the conditioner. Um, questions there, Nora? None yet. The guy in Texas found that you had to put the mineral in with the cattle to get them to consume it. Um, so apple cider vinegar. Um, Again, we're trying to make up something that's not in our animal. 100 years ago in uh, New Zealand, the biggest, the biggest uh, selection criteria was for a milk cow was how big her belly was. She could eat and digest. It's not what we eat, it's what we digest. She could eat and digest enough grass to make the milk. So we need a girth, uh, perfect cow. That says girth, that should actually be flank. That shouldn't be right behind the front legs. That should be in front of the udder. So that's the wrong word there, Nora. When we get through, you might wanna go in. And the top line is from the pin bones to the pole, the top of the, the head. Um, well, she's got, Three commonalities with old cows. This was in the uh, last PowerPoint. This was 9,500, one breed anywhere from Mexico up to Canada. 
a bigger belly than the herd average. She could eat and digest enough for three, a wider butt than the herd average, calving ease and fleshing ability, and then slope from hooks down to pins uh, so we could get the calf out. Anyway, the longer we leave that calf on that high butterfat cow, the more we develop the villi inside the rumen. So we're getting more digestion out of that particular rumen. And then uh, good glandular function. Well, if she sheds early in the spring, now we've got a cow that can do it on her own. But if we're not there, you know, we could, we, there's some breeding and development decisions we could do to achieve that. But until we get there, the enzymes in the raw, unpasteurized apple cider vinegar, um, anywhere from 20 to 35 percent. Don't, when you're trying to plan this out, don't think 35, 20, 25 percent less. Hey, there was a, a pasture deal done in the spring in Kentucky with 550 pounders uh, just getting started on grass and they took them and split them into two groups one um, one group got well they weighed 550 one group got three ounces of vinegar a day and the other group didn't get any everything else was pretty much the same after 60 days the ones that had gotten the vinegar had gained 48 more pounds than those that hadn't gotten the vinegar. In uh, Cannon Falls, Minnesota, 1,150 pounders getting six ounces per head per day were consuming between 20 and 25% less hay and gaining the same amount. Uh, the way you really know if you need this is this, the particle length in the manure. If you're down to a quarter or three eighths of an inch, you're digesting that just fine. The, the higher the bricks of the feed, the better they're gonna digest it. And then middle of the summer, it's hot, uh, dried out hay in the winter, though that makes it very difficult uh, if it's lignified, dried out to get it all digested out of there. And that's when your particle length's gonna be longer than this. Um, some cows maintain body condition and uniform hair coats, um, and some don't. We need, uh, we need more, we need to breed uh, more of those animals that maintain their body condition. And then there is an enzyme in all of the unpasteurized apple cider vinegar called nitrate reductase. Well, we're using so much nitrogen these days that, that it's hard for the cow to process that well the vinegar actually helps her get rid of that excess nitrogen uh, golden valley it's here in idaho uh, they're the only ones that use whole apples uh, fleischmann's and manzanta they both you start out with apple juice concentrate which uh, they had to heat it up and kill all the enzymes there's a really good book called Enzyme Nutrition by Dr. Edward Howell. Above 112 degrees, you start killing enzymes. Anyway, that was a, an aside on the human side of things. The, uh, even though it's acid, it's alkaline forming in the body. That alkaline forming is what actually uh, keeps flies, lice, worms away. If you've already got those things, it's going to take more to get rid of them. Um, then because uh, Golden Valley uses whole apples, there's this heavy apple cider vinegar. Has more of the apple in there, but it has more mother. And so its digestive aid is even higher than the regular Golden Valley vinegar. Uh, 20 to 30. Okay, good there. Questions? Um, so you could put it in your, in your stock tank every day. Um, a cow typically, uh, four to six ounces. The normal range is one ounce to every two to 300 pounds of body weight. If you're going to try to put this out for cows to just consume it, you're going to need more rim space, kind of like that one longer uh, feeder that you saw a little earlier. Um, 
Young animals, it takes them longer to figure out what it is. Um, yeah, okay. A lick wheel tank, uh, not a lick tub, but a lick wheel tank works pretty well with the heavy uh, apple cider vinegar or the heavy juice, which is another part of the process. Anyway, uh, once they find those two, vinegar or juice, even on that lick wheel tank, they'll, they'll typically tend to consume more than they need. And you can slow them down by adding sea salt to it. Uh, we'll talk about that. Well, we talked about it last night, but we'll talk about it more. Anyway, this, this uh, rubber wheel, about four and a half, five foot long and maybe 10 inches tall, those work pretty well. One of those would probably be big enough for about, no, 60 to 75 cows uh, and put a 50 pound bag once they've found it. Once they know what it is and they are over consuming, I see so many people, they go home, they put the sea salt in it right away and then the, they wonder why the cattle won't consume the vinegar. Well, they didn't let them find it first. It, it kind of puts out the fire in their belly and they want it. Well, then you're trying to slow them down. So once they've found it, uh, a 50 pound bag of sea salt in there, uh, four gallons of vinegar, stir it up. Tomorrow morning when you come by, if the liquid's all gone, another gallon of vinegar, stir it up. And you just keep doing that until the sea salt is all gone, adding that gallon every day. When the sea salt's all gone, another 50 pound bag of sea salt and uh, four gallons of vinegar and start the process over there in South Dakota in the winter. Um, they said over the course of about three months, uh, the animals averaged four to five ounces of sea salt a day and five to six ounces of vinegar a day. Questions there, Nora? Yes, does the <clears throat> apple cider vinegar freeze in the winter time? Not if it's got 50 pounds of sea salt added to it. And that was the reason that they went to do this. It will, uh, just a second, there's a, there's a, Okay, I've got a I've got a lick wheel tank there. I've got a tractor tire. It's black. I got a dead air space. I got a lid on it. But at about five or ten degrees, those wheels froze up. You know, I was I was good down to about that. But um, yeah, it will freeze in the winter time. You've got to keep it thawed out in the shop or something if you're going to use it. Um, there, this particular toad had a three inch ball valve. And uh, I just went to Home Depot and got a, the uh, RV hose for the sewer. And, and it worked just great as this old thing. You just plug it right in. Um, but yeah, the, that was the reason that they went back to mixing this 50 pounds of salt. They knew they wanted to feed vinegar. They could keep the vinegar thawed out and they could entice the salt without having to go buy soybeans or cracked corn or something like that. So yes, the vinegar itself will freeze in the winter. You can put a bag or, or two of, of sea salt in the tote of vinegar once you get a little head space, but, but that's not gonna protect it down to zero. Okay. Um, Energy requirement. So I mentioned this juice a little bit ago. The, uh, they're at Golden Valley, they get the apples in and crush them up and, and they've got them in a 50,000 gallon tank and um, they turn into apple juice, apple cider, and then hard apple cider, 6% alcohol. Well, then they run it through the acetator and convert the alcohol to acetic acid. Well, there's a part of that apple deal that's too thick. And so that's this heavy juice, I call it rebound. Anyway, it's about three times the energy. So in the middle, up, the middle of the winter up north or in the middle of the summer down in Texas, the, the apple juice, the heavy juice is really works well. Now, it is not alkaline forming in the body. So you need to be feeding conditioner 
and or baking soda uh, alongside to keep the animal alkaline so the lice don't show up or the flies don't show up depending. But if you need more energy, pretty good energy. Um, okay, I had it right there. Um, kind of said all of that. It still has digestive enzymes here. Maybe you're not going to get that 20% but you're gonna get at least 10 or 15% uh, digestive aid out of the, uh, the heavy juice. And then uh, the enzymes from the whole apple, uh, it depends how much you, where you live uh, and what kind of feed you've got. But uh, if you spend a dollar, you save two. And if you're close, maybe three, depending on these, on these different things. Um, the, the, the worse your feed, the, the more valuable that is. Now, back to that perfect cow. She's got a gut that's eight inches larger than her top line. You left her on the, left her as a calf on her mother for 10 months to develop the villi and the rumen. Mom had a lot of butter fat. She's got good glandular function. She's uh, inherent body condition. She's going to do better. She's going to need less of this. But if you don't have that cow yet, this is probably the, in my opinion, the cheapest way to, to get that through the winter of, for the lowest cost. So questions about vinegar, um, the clay? Not yet. Am I just talking so fast or everybody's already hung up? No, they're still okay. with us. <laughs> so if you've got that manure sticking there, you, you're just about three days too late um, getting there with the sodium bicarbonate. In the spring of the year, the, uh, the potassium level in the grass goes up. It's uh, Mother Nature's antifreeze. And um, the grass is growing real fast. They'll, they'll want, uh, well, how do I say this best? Potassium and sodium chloride, they're, they, they use a little bit similarly. I can't really say that, but I kind of can. That time of year, they'll really go after the so sodium bicarbonate to balance their rumen. When you see that manure on their butt, they have, there's an imbalance in their feet. Kick yourself in the foot for not having it out there in time. Uh, in the middle of the summer, it hasn't rained for five or six weeks, and then you get a big thunder lightning rainstorm. That nitrogen from the lightning, the nitrate level in the grass goes up. They'll get manure on their butts. You're too late. You, you, need, to, you need to have it out there Right at, as soon as the storm ends, you need it out there, um, or you'll your cattle are going to slow down on gain. And then in the fall of the year, when it starts frosting, the chloride level in the grass goes up. Cows still want sodium, but not sodium chloride. But they'll take the sodium bicarbonate. Anyway, those would be the three times a year when it would come in to affect the most importance. However, if you have pink eye or flies, sodium bicarbonate is a pretty good band-aid. If you've got lice, sodium bicarbonate is a pretty good band-aid. Um, this Siner soda ash, uh, there's, and it's in, uh, it's in uh, southwestern uh, uh, Wyoming. It's uh, by Green River, Wyoming. And then the natural soda out of Rifle, Colorado. Arm and Hammer is the worst of the, the sodium bicarbonates out there. Um, I suggest not buying that one. There, that Question, ought to give you Steve. Any. Okay. Can you just leave the baking soda with them year round? Why would you remove it? Well, everybody's trying to get the most benefit at the least cost. Uh, some of this stuff is probably a uh, leap of faith, and um, 
it, it, <laughs> it depends on what you're doing with your cattle. I, I left it out there year round, okay? Uh, especially if you can figure out how to get this stuff up there. Uh, and this uh, signer soda ash, I really want to dig into that. I've left a message, email, and phone. Hopefully, I'll hear back from them. And if I do, Nora, I'll put them in touch with you. And then your group can talk to them about, uh, you know, how to get their product. But um, one or two ounces a day, I mean, one year round and... Uh, Oh, if the flies are showing up in uh, July and August, sometime in June, go to two ounces. And as soon as the flies leave, go back to one. And about the time you're ready to start feeding the hay in the winter, go to two. Because that's going to be the two times a year when your animals would naturally be, or maybe I should say unnaturally be, they... If they were if they were shaped right and we still had all the fertility of the soil, yada, yada, uh, this wouldn't be a problem. But those would be the two times when you would need that Band-Aid of uh, alkalinization from the sodium bicarbonate the most is July and August and then in the winter when you're feeding hay. Other question? Nope, that was it. Okay. Um, it depends. <laughs> a lot of these things depend. And um, the bigger cow doesn't have a bigger gland system. And, and maybe what I really want to leave you with is the bottom of that. The, the poorer your genetics, your phenotype, the butter fat, the uh, lack of developing the villi and the rumen for for uh, digestion, the more you're going to need all of these other things. Um, kind of back to Kirk there, he was feeding eight ounces, eight ounces of sea salt a day, seven to eight. More, most of that was going out the back of the cow. He, he probably doesn't even realize that this coming summer, his grass is going to be better than it was the year before, and he probably wouldn't even need to feed that much again but um it didn't get out of the system the cow he was moving his cattle every day so the cows were putting the manure right where he needed it um this stuff gets better over time i i don't know how to, how else to say that the uh kind of like i said there last night if you want to spend the least amount of money and get the most effect do the mineral water and uh, if you want to change your cows the most, if you just try to get rid of that raised tail process, there'll be other things that get correct by getting rid of that raised tail process in your cow. So that's kind of the, what, two floor elevator speech for two full talks is mineral water and get rid of that tail process. Um, five ounces of sea salt dry or the mineral water and two ounces dry, you know, whatever they would normally ingest. They will go salt hungry. If all they have is the mineral water, they will go salt hungry. You're going to need it out dried with the mineral water. And then the conditioner, three ounces, uh, accepting that month before calving, if anything negative shows up, and then just before you put the bulls in, hit it really hard again, four or five ounces a day. Um, we use the baking soda and the conditioner or clay, this jackpot here, the, the fellow with all the flies in 36 hours, we threw those animals alkaline enough, the flies left in the middle of fly season. All right. Um, different oh, ways. One question, Ooh. Steve. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do these additives help break down manure better? And have you seen or heard of negative effects to insects? And I presume she's talking about the insects in uh, the manure. Um, all of these things uh, are friends of the biology in the soil or, or on top. I had a guy, uh, this last year was my last of 20 years of grass finishing. And, and I was, you know, I, I had made my plan three years ago to get out. So I had a fellow from across the river bring some bred heifers over and he wanted to give shots and we're about halfway through and 
and you know, I'm asking what he's given. Well, one of them is long range. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my dung beetles. <laughs> what am I gonna do? So I fed six or seven ounces of Redmond conditioner for about 45 days to his cows. And he said his cows look better here than any other place he had them. I bound up that long range coming out of the back of those cows and it didn't affect my dung beetles at all. I was a happy camper, all right? So no, the, the, uh, the DE, the conditioner, the vinegar, the uh, sea salt, the apple cider vinegar, that you're just gonna have happy bugs. You're not gonna kill any. Um, my opinion okay. this particular okay. go ahead another question no nope, no more questions okay. so this particular slide what i'm trying to say is there's all these different ways to get the biology back in the soil and the more of those you do the quicker you're going to get the biology in the soil which means the more minerals that are 90 percent bioavailable are going to be in your plants and the less of everything i just said you're going to need the less of everything I just explained sea salt, conditioner, baking soda, apple cider vinegar the better your soil, the better your grass, the fewer of these supplements you're going to need over time. They're just a crutch to get you from here to fertile soil. And there's some contact information. Other questions? Not yet. Um, Nor remind me to send you that, uh, those notes uh, about Steve Swerzy. About what, sorry? Uh, a fellow, uh, we took some notes from a, about three different schools kind of a combined uh, list of notes about the toxins okay. and what they yeah. do and then uh, how to get around them with all of these things we're talking about here. Okay. Um, I do have in chat, says, Adrian says, we can listen to Steve talk all night. So I guess we're not going anywhere. <laughs> Question, well, can you please discuss biochar? Oh, we didn't ever get there. Yeah. So a friend of mine is producing that in Missoula, Montana. And I told him to send some to uh, Steve Swarzyk. But oh, golly, there was a Frenchman giving a talk at a, a winter conference about three or four years ago in uh, uh, South Dakota. And he was talking about uh, um, glyphosate and all of that. And there was a lady there that really knew her stuff and biochar and how good it did at drawing the toxins out of human beings and, and also animals. I mean, we're both, um, we're both uh, mammals. Um, anyway, how does it work? Uh, it just works. I don't know how it works. If you've got a good source, you absolutely can use that. Um, oh golly, real fine coal dust is fairly good stuff to add in a small quantity into your, uh, your mineral. Um, and then I did send you how to make the, uh, the free choice, uh, uh, phosphorus and the free choice calcium. You're welcome to share that with, with everybody, Nora. But yeah, I'm, I'm all in on the biochar, especially if you've got a, a local source there. Okay, next question. In a winter bale graze system, can you pour apple cider vinegar on the bales? <laughs> you can, but probably the, the better way to do it. I mean, yes, you can, but the better way to do it is make vinegar hay. Um, you don't want the heavy stuff because it wouldn't fit through your uh, old uh, gandy box on the, the, the baler. But uh, 
three gallons per ton of hay applied to the windrow just before you bale it, you can bale up to about 23% moisture and it won't mold. And that winds up being five or six ounces per cow in the winter as you're feeding the hay, you don't have to deal with freezing liquid in the middle of the winter. Uh, and so the, the better way to do it is to make what they call vinegar hay. Um, you, you got a storm coming, we can, we can bail it up here at 20%. I mean, you can put three gallons on there and bail it at 14 or 15 or 16%, not a problem, but you can bail it. Uh, Will Winter there in uh, Minneapolis, he's probably talked about that more than anybody else. But yes, you can you can put it on those bales, round bales, uh, if you barrel them up and uh, put it on top and let it, depending on how, how tight they're wrapped, uh, you can let it percolate down through for a while and then lay them back down and roll them out or bale graze or, or whatever you want to do. Now, if you're going to put all those bales out, you're going to have these frozen spots, but it'll, it'll just be a uh, apple cider vinegar popsicle, and, and they'll, they'll eat that popsicle uh, uh, through the winter. So I presume, Steve, a question from me, uh, you are able to get large quantities of the apple cider vinegar and what is your source? Well, Golden Valley vinegar, it's in Fruitland. I, oh, live, right. four, I live four miles from that plant. So what we figured the mileage from me to you oh, yesterday or something, it was a long ways. It was, and I think uh, actually maybe that was to Edmonton. So was it a thousand miles to Edmonton? I think I think so. Um, yeah. Now, the the very best way. Now, I just mentioned the vinegar hay. Yeah. But whether you were going to get vinegar hay, uh, excuse me, vinegar for vinegar hay, or you wanted the heavy vinegar, which was more feed digestion for the rest of the year, uh, putting it in a tanker, mm -hmm. uh, right. <laughs> you get about fifty six hundred gallons. And uh, you need 22 empty totes on your end. That'll be the cheapest way to get either product up there. Right. Um, but you, if you really can't mix them, because because then you foul up both both deals. Uh, you you if you were thinking there were enough people wanted to do vinegar, hey, you could get uh, well and and hey, uh, maybe it would be a deal where you wanted. Uh, some heavy vinegar for just the regular deal and you wanted uh, a tanker load of the vinegar to make vinegar hay which is a gangbuster good idea right. um well maybe there would be uh baking soda out of uh wyoming that we could get over here and then put everything on one semi so you had you know i don't know how i've, I've seen some pretty big trucks come out of canada uh, maybe you could put mm -hmm. 60, 65,000 pounds of stuff on one truck, right. make it more reasonable to get it up there. Yeah, we'll just have to see what the interest is. Mm -hmm. uh, next question, you mentioned DE. Do you mean diatomaceous earth? If so, do you put it out separately or mix it with another product? Um, I do mean diatomaceous earth. I was using it for that and apple cider vinegar for uh, parasite control worms. Uh, living in New Meadows, uh, we were flood irrigating and we had liver flukes. And I could not kill, I could kill all the other worms with uh, DE uh, and the vinegar, but I couldn't kill the liver flukes. But two years later, I didn't have any liver flukes. I could keep them from getting in the livers, but once they were there, I couldn't get rid of them. Well, I wasn't gonna use a chemical, so, um, and I didn't really realize the power of the bicarb at that time when I first started this other, the, the, the whole concept of the alkaline versus acid. If a person wants to get in to that, 
Carrie Reams, Reams Biological Theory of Ionization, I think it is, RBTI. Okay. Reams Next. Biological, RBTI, yeah. Okay. Um, um, so Kendall, Kevin had just um, typed in Q&A is Nora, I have bought 200 liters he thinks, of raw organic um, apple cider vinegar containers from a fellow at a Sylvan Lake. Uh, yes, if you would uh, share his number with me, that would be great. And if anybody's interested, if they would please email me and then I can share that. And Kevin says he gets it from Eastern Canada, but he's not certain of the actual source. So Kevin, if you'll share that uh, number with me, then I can share with anybody else that's interested. And Kevin, um, along that line, uh, contact those people in Eastern Canada and find out if they started with whole apples or if they started with apple juice concentrate because you won't get the feed digestion uh, out, of the, uh, out of the stuff where they started out with apple juice concentrate. You'll get the acid, or excuse me, the alkaline forming response from the vinegar that where they started with apple juice concentrate. And then the, the only place to get pe uh, enzymes is the peels and cores they add to that process. I'm gonna turn a light on here. Hang, hang on one second. Yep. Um, anyway. Next, uh, next question is how long can you store apple cider vinegar? Um, Basically indefinitely, the uh, the plastic tote will probably give up uh, before the vinegar. At, at above 112, you're killing the enzymes. Well, it'd probably have to be 135 during the day and 100 degrees at night or something to ever get it up above 112. So you're it's not going to get hot enough to kill the enzymes. Just not in the sun. And then that way that that container, the plastic uh, tote, and you said a 200 liter, but that's like a 55 gallon drum. The, the uh, 275 gallon totes are a thousand liter uh, containers. Right. You'll need you'll need 22 of those thousand liter containers for a for a tanker. Have any portion recommend? Do you have any portion recommendations for human consumption of clay, apple cider vinegar, salt, sodium bicarbonate? I do. That's the next talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, well, let's go back to the DE a little bit there. I personally, whenever I make a smoothie, I use a tablespoon, a heaping tablespoon of diatomaceous earth. But I'm kind of one that tends to go overboard. The, the clay or the conditioner to, to consume, I don't like a person to start out consuming it right off the bat because you can get what they call a Herxheimer response, a healing crisis. In the book, we eat clay and wear it too. Nora, um, remind me to, to send that to you and then you can send it out. There's a lady about 75 who uh, takes, oh my gosh, maybe uh, what's this, this much volume above my hand here of the Redmond clay, a uh, Rubbermaid tub and really warm water. Puts her feet in there with the intention of pulling toxins out of the bottom of her feet. Well, in the 15 or 20 minutes it took for the water to cool off, she must have forgotten what she was doing. Being frugal, she didn't want to throw it away. So she watered her house plants and killed every plant in her house. She would pulled so many toxins out of her feet. So I suggest you soak your feet or do the put it in your socks for a while. However, hang on one second. So this morning, I don't know if you can see this, uh, it's just yeah. a, a cup 
and I put a teaspoon of um, the clay in there. I, I had it full of water first, and then I put a teaspoon of clay. I didn't stir it at all. Uh, I just let it hydrate itself all day. Now I'll stir that up and drink that before I go to bed and I'll fill it back up with water and put another teaspoon of the clay in there and let it hydrate itself and drink that tomorrow, uh, which might be a little more than I need. However, I've been on the road for a month and uh, I, uh, I would put that into some of my bottles of water, but I just wasn't as uh, religious about it as I am at home. So I'm kind of doubling up here for a week or so to, to get the toxins of the road out of me. Uh, what was the other one, uh, the baking soda? Okay, so Nora, um, email me about an acid alkaline forming foods chart. You can get the uh, pH paper from the, um, uh, oh, wherever you get prescriptions. What do you call those stores? I don't go in them. There we go. Yeah, pharmacy. pharmacy. You can get the pH paper. We really need to be at 6.6 .6 or higher. Most of us aren't. You can uh, use lemons, which are acid, but they're alkaline forming. You can use vinegar, even though it's an acid, it's alkaline forming. Uh, baking soda. Uh, but on that acid alkaline forming foods chart, you can vary what you eat, like plain white salt is acid forming, sea salt is alkaline forming. Um, and then try to get your pH up above seven. If you're down around six or five, eight or something, you really need to get up above seven for a month or so because we don't digest and store minerals very well when we're in an acid state. We need to get replenished and then you could drop back to six, six or so. Uh, and if you're, you're either saliva or urine every day, uh, that would tell you how much uh, of the baking soda or the vinegar or the lemons uh, that you would ingest. Okay, and Kevin did supply a phone number and a fellow's name. So if you're interested, and this is a source for the apple cider vinegar, just click on Q&A and the questions and answers come up. And Kevin has typed in the fellow's name is Rick and his number is 403-350-6088. And like I say, if you click on Q&A, then you'll see it. And I've got it recorded here. If you didn't get it, just let me know and I can share that with you. And, and the only question there is, did they start out with apple juice concentrate? Right, and Kevin said he'll see what he can find out. Okay. No more questions, no more raised hands. Well, I've enjoyed myself. I hope it was <laughs> worthwhile. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. And you've got your contact information up there. So uh, if anybody wants to contact you, you either can. And I know you just have to Google Steve Campbell and your contact information, your website comes up. So. Uh, they can always okay. do it that way too. So, and I will try and get these um, videos up on our website by early next week anyway. Um, there's a hey, question. Nora, yep. Go I, ahead. Have, I have an idea, Nora. We could, I yep. could go up to the Canadian border and you guys could all come down to the other side and we could just talk across the line. Now that's an excellent idea. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Maybe we won't have to worry about that line okay. soon. Okay. Uh, question, what was the name of the clay from, she has S-A, or he has S-A-D-K again. Uh, just a second. Is it here. bentonite or what? Uh, oh, sir could have gotten out of this. I'm almost there. Oh, from Saskatchewan, sorry. <laughs> there we go, there we go, there we go. Anyway, um, okay. I left a message with those folks, uh, but I didn't hear back yet. Okay. But this uh, Montmorillonite, 
uh, bentonite. Um, well, the, the stuff out of Utah is a montmorillonite sodium bentonite. And these are all part of the zeolite family, um, but not every bentonite is created equal. Um, okay. So they probably have three or four different grades of bentonite. You want to seal the bottom of a pond, probably not what you're wanting to feed the cattle. I would just, yeah. Um, anyway, the feed, feed grade, sodium, oh, here we go, sodium bentonite right here. Mm -hmm. So. Um, South Dakota, Wyoming. Yep, yep. So, you know, here we've got these same volcanic eruptions. Um, well, hey, we've got um, sodium bicarbonate. Um, and I don't know, but maybe they're from a volcanic eruption. That I don't know. But uh, it's, they're all different sodiums, sodium chloride, sodium bentonite, sodium bicarbonate, you know, I, yeah. I'm not a geologist, so, <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, we have one last comment. That's so much for the wonderful two evenings. We very much appreciate it. Lots to take in and ruminate on. So I think that's it for tonight, Steve. Thank you very, oh. very much. I will email you with the list uh, that you had asked me to and- uh, Okay then I'll have that information for anybody that wants it can just contact me. Again, thanks Perfect. a million, Steve, for joining us. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk again soon in the future. All right. Okay. Thank Good you. Good night, everybody. Good night.